pleasure to introduce Robert Walker. Um, I have my information here, mathematician, philosopher and logger on space, and Robert's going to talk to us about that super positive outcomes for the search for uh, life in Enceladus and Europa. Thanks very much. <laughs> Imagine if you could look at a random splash of seawater filled with tiny extraterrestrial creatures. You could find something as wonderful as this in these plumes, a chance for a super positive outcome. So how does that influence how we can explore? Cassini has sampled the plumes already, flying through them with no chance of contaminating the oceans. A gold star for planetary protection. So this is something we know that we can do. In Celtus is a sure thing as its plumes erupt continuously, feeding Saturn's E-ring. Europa's plumes are much more uncertain. They may be sporadic and short-lived, like this Icelandic geyser, and fall straight back to the uh, right away in the higher gravity, making it more of a challenge to sample them. And this plume that Hubble saw could be made by a large meteorite, or a result of it. When Cassini passed Europa on its way to Saturn, it saw nothing. It would have spotted the likes of Enceladus's plumes easily. So I'll focus on Enceladus for now, but this will apply to Europa if we can sample its plumes. Enceladus's ocean is kept liquid by eccentricity tides. It can't go into a circular orbit because of the resonances with Dione. And its heat budget is a long-standing puzzle. Some models work, but they have to make assumptions about its interior. Evidence from earlier tiger stripes that have frozen over suggests it may be freezing slowly. We don't need to worry about the next few thousand years, but the geysers may stop within 200 million years. And the same geological evidence suggests its ocean is at least a billion years old. Its interior is probably like a carbonaceous chondrite meteorite, unprocessed early solar system material rich in organics. That's great for life, except that it's also completely undifferentiated and porous. It's thought that all salt from its interior has flown into its ocean. So it may have reached chemical equilibrium and any life run out of food, extinct or sparse. On the other hand, Tidal effects might easily supply enough energy for a complex ecosystem. Cassini's measurements suggest two main possibilities, a very alkaline soda lake or less alkaline white smoker type uh, hydrothermal vent with hot rocks. Or its ocean may be young, only a billion years old. Or perhaps life evolved more slowly. If so, perhaps it has early stages of life or no life. There's a tendency to look at this and look at the right-hand side and say, um, this is what astrobiology is all about, a complex life. And for the left side, let's leave it to the planetary geologists. We might even feel a duty to bring Earth life to a lifeless ocean. I'm going to suggest that early life, or non-life, is also of extraordinary interest for astrobiology. As well, we have nowhere near the understanding needed. It's accidental or intentional ocean eco-engineers. And this visualisation shows how Earth life makes protein. Here, messenger RNA, produced by DNA polymerase, meets a ribosome a huge complex machine that spontaneously assembles around it. And uh, these green transfer molecules each bring a single amino acid to the emerging protein chain. And you can see the amino acids as red dots at the tips. So this is going on at this speed in every cell of every known Earth creature. And this visualization just hints at the complexity. So it works. But it seems Heath Robinson or Rube Goldberg, if you're from the States, like the professor's Tatu peeling machine. Life must have started simpler. Perhaps a self-replicated polymer, not yet alive, but encoding information. Or perhaps an autopoietic cell. This means it takes in ingredients, uses them to recreate its metabolism and the cell wall, and expels waste. It's only a dozen or so chemicals, and it just splits when it gets large enough, or a daughter cell from inside escapes. This shows time of origin against gene complexity on a log plot. Prokaryotes, the cells without a nucleus, are the oldest. Continue the line back as a straight line, and across the axis is around double the age of the solar system. So perhaps life started around another star, an older star, and this passes through a nebula where our solar system is forming at the tip of one of these fingers. It misses most of the embryo stars, but by chance comes close enough to ours to transfer life by meteorite impacts. It can do this from quite a distance. Earth could be forming in one of these dark bands. Or the solid line may show the characteristic slope of DNA with error correction, and perhaps early life evolved more quickly and in our solar system. Life in these extraterrestrial oceans could be anywhere on this graph. 
Europa's ocean, rich in oxygen, uh, could even have the likes of fish and octopuses. And life in this uh, it's unlikely, after being so fierce, that European and Earth life reach exactly the same stage of evolution. And modern multi life is quite recent on Earth, so it might not have evolved there yet. Or it might have evolved to some future form of life that we don't have yet. As far advanced beyond it, us, as we are advanced beyond the first multi complex multi life. And you'd think on Facebook, perhaps 50-50 either way. And if it got that far, what about civilization, millions of years old, in an ocean without fire, the technology would be limited. They would know nothing about us, we would know nothing about them. In the other direction, uh, more than half of evolution is hidden from us, according to this graph of complexity. Each pixel here covers over 70 million years. So our lab experiments, like Yuri Miller, explore a tiny fa fragment of the very first pixel. That leaves a huge gap, which must have steps as momentous as the nucleus of eukaryotes, what's still alive, plants and animals. But what these are down here, we can only guess. In some ways, that might be the most interesting of all, to fill a little of this gap. That's why I suggest an earlier life or non-life ocean would be just as interesting for astrobiology. Then, whether early or highly evolved, would we have a common ancestor? If it's life around another star and the oceans are ancient, we could be related. But by one estimate, there have been at most 10 meteorites from Earth exchanged over the entire solar system with Ardian Celtus or Europa. So if the ocean is young, with any previous life long decayed, or if life evolved quickly in our solar system, seems an excellent chance that it's independently evolved. If independently evolved, will it still resemble Earth life? Earth life uh, may seem optimal, leaving little scope for variation. It's stopped at 20 main amino acids, after all, and that's with a lot of spare coding capacity. Here we see serine, for instance, is coded in four different ways. Each of these could have coded for a different amino acid. However, this could easily be a local optimum. Let's think of how anything you want to optimise, such as efficiency of the entire cell. You start in Australia and keep walking up, and eventually you get to the top of a small hillock. If you allow yourself to go up and down and travel great distances, the highest peak you will reach is only a little over 2,000 metres 2, meters high, less than, less than half the height of Mont Blanc. If you were at the very top of this peak, because it's a summit in this analogy, any tweaks such as adding more amino acids will always take you downhill. So you might well think that Earth life is the best that any life could possibly be. But then if you start in North America, you'd end up at the top of Mount McKinley, which again would be a summit and seem totally optimal. Everything you try takes you downhill unless you were to explore as far as South America. And then both of those would be a lot lower than Mount Everest, which you reach as you gradually explore Eurasia. So there may be many different optimal best solutions for life, and we only know of one, which is used in all Earth life, even the oldest cells of prokaryotes. So what's more, life in cells could be better than us, than Mount Everest of metabolisms. Or Earth uh, 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 metabolism could be Mount Everest, and its held us relatively feeble. Again, if it has, does have life at all, and we're just looking at the early cells, then it seems perhaps 50-50. Specialists who study the interior of a cell sometimes compare the complexity of the interactions to an ecosystem. In this analogy, all Earth life has the same ecosystem inside. And this is a few of the things inside it, and the experts could add many more, common to all Earth life, with slight variations, but it's the same things. Um, this ecosystem is so similar, life forms often swap genes in parallel transfer, and they still work. Here's a gene from a fungus, gave this pea aphid the ability to generate carotenoids, which turns it red like a carrot. Imagine if the African savanna was the only ecosystem biologists knew about, with minor variations, and then one day we discover a coral reef. We have never seen a tropical rainforest, tundra, the seashore, or anything. This shows how much we could learn just from observation of a single cell or protocell cell based on different principles. So of course we are careful. This is one of the Viking landers, gold standard of planetary protection on Mars. Nevertheless, you can question if it was sterilized enough. The aim was to have no more than a one in a thousand chance of contaminating Mars during the exploration stage, which is how they were thinking about it then. Is that enough, given the chance of a super positive outcome? Anyway, that decision is made. And it's generally thought we have not contaminated Mars with Earth life, mainly because conditions there are so harsh. It's important to know we haven't yet looked at our spacecraft from Mars to see how many dormant microbes they have and in what species. Our calculations predict that there are microbes there. Uh, and that they're sitting there doing nothing. Again, we don't know for sure because we just haven't checked. For instance, Phoenix was crushed with the advancing winter dry ice sheet. We have no experimental data from Mars on this, on what happened to the microbes in it. So this is a little bit shaky. We don't think we have contaminated Mars, but it's not the best basis for making decisions about the ice moons. 
National Research Council looked at it, especially since these oceans are much more habitable than Mars and probability assessments are more uncertain here, this approach used for, vac used for Viking just wouldn't work. They recommended binary decision trees. The orbiter will fly by past the stage at test at stage 5 with a yes. Uh, because it's not going to encounter a habitable region, but any itself is ice mall or penetrate or cryobot passes all the way through to the final step. And then you have stringent planetary protection or cancel mission. The Russians in Antarctica drilled nearly all the way down to Lake Vostok and then discovered they were approaching a lake. So they just stopped for over a decade. Eventually they drilled into it in such a way as to trigger a mini geyser of 30 or 40 meters to prevent forward contamination into the lake. This is like a flyby mission. So far, they've only sampled this plume. It would be easy to send a submarine down, but they feel they haven't got, yet got the technology to sterilize it. So in the same way, when exploring Enceladus, we should always have the option, cancel the mission, not ready yet. This rabbit-proof fence was built, oh sorry, what's going on? This rabbit-proof fence was built to protect Western Australia in the 1900s from rabbits introduced by European colonists. It's the longest fence in the world, and it did work after fashion for some years. Cartoons had a field day showing here probable use that rabbits might make of it. I wonder what kind of fence we could put across the Enceladus Ocean. So COSPA recommend a target of a chance of 1 in 10,000 contamination in the next 1,000 years. However, there's a lot of discussion. There's no science you can do, and there's no a priori calculation. There's no experiments that you can do that can give you these two numbers. It's, a, it's an ethical decision. And if you think about it as a potential super positive outcome, you might look at those numbers a bit differently. We have a chance of a super positive benefit to billions of people, revolutionizing perhaps medicine, agriculture, nanotechnology, and we don't know how probable it is, but it is a possibility. In the direction of sample return to Earth, the legal situation is clear, and this is a principle of modern international law introduced because of the new things we can do. A sample return could, in the worst case, impact on the habitability of the Earth. For instance, if we return a life form that's better than Earth life, that could degrade the environment. In situations like this, we must take precautions, even if we don't know what's in it. Uh, we, it's no good saying, I have no idea, but surely it's okay to use hand-waving arguments. We have to take precautions anyway, and it's us that have to do the science, and the discussion has to involve all affected parties, which in this case in, for, may mean the entire world. And we can never say, we are the scientists, we will make a decision for you. That's totally wrong. And you have to consider all possibilities, including always, again, no action. That can get forgotten. If you ask experts, how can I return this sample safely? very natural thing to say, that's the wrong question. They must always have the option to say, it is not safe yet, if that is what their the research shows. I suggest it should be the same for super positive outcomes in the forward direction. We should, should take precautions, even though we have no idea what is there. As proponents, it's up to us to prove that our actions are not going to impact on it. And I would say, because it is super positive, it impacts on the entire Earth, because those billions will be affected <coughs> in a positive way in this case. So it should be simply open and involved discussing all possibilities, include again, no action. And here I've changed the first sentence for the wingspread text, which is one of the statements for the precautionary principle. So you can, so you can see the idea of harm to health or the environment, and, and then change that to super positive out outcome. And I think you get a reasonable uh, guideline in the forward direction. And Carl Sagermont said, well, about self return from Mars, you can't take even a small risk with a, a, a billion lives. And Nick Bostrom has developed a philosophical approach to looking at risks, risks like this. Uh, as I say, risk of serious impact on human habitability, habitability of the Earth and our future life prospects. It suggests that we haven't evolved an intuition for these risks um, because we haven't encountered them before. And he says one way to look at it is this mathematical argument. So, for instance, uh, Studying sample return, they often use a risk of a one in a million, which is a tiny figure, which is standard for lab biosafety laboratory designs. But if you multiply that by the population of the Earth, then you get an expected number of 7,300 people that could be harmed. And that becomes millions or trillions if, it's, um, if you look at future humans as well, if they could also be affected. So even with a tiny chance like that, sometimes the effect numbered impacted should be, can be huge. And I suggest the uh, same applies in the forward direction. There's absolutely no impact on human health. But if you increase the chance for a super positive outcome by 1 in 10,000 by taking a bit more care, 
uh, and you do the same ex calculations, expected number is 730,000 people that could be that positively benefited. And again, that becomes billions and trillions if you're talking about the positive benefit for future uh, generations. So here, uh, possible future beings from Earth, they're studying Enceladus. And the bottom left, that's H.G. Wells human for a million years in the future, a little more than eyes and brain because machines do everything. And then the humanoids of an avatar, standing for the idea of future humans more closely connected ecologically with the Earth. Then there's Alex, the grey parrot, possibly the most intelligent non-human we know about. Perhaps in the future we may get civilizations of descendants of parrots and other creatures either coexisting or falling on. Over the next 500 million years, surely thousands of such civilizations will arise and form, and from time to time some of them will visit Enceladus. So we have a potential super positive outcome for all of them, not just for ourselves, and of course for any beings in, in the oceans already. This is the next step up from a flyby, an orbiter. In the plans, it starts with several gravity assist uh, flybys of Titan off the picture, then the inner moons, and ending up in an equatorial orbit around Enceladus, but almost no total delta V. Sadly, a polar orbit around Enceladus is unstable, so it can only pass through the geysers at its south pole occasionally. But the big advantage is that it can capture the material at around 100 meters per second. This is only eight times faster than Usain Bolt. With capturing into soft materials, we can hope to find even viable microbial spores and intact autopoietic cells if they exist. You might think that every sample would be the same. However, we'll be able to fly at different heights, for instance, lower than the larger particles, to collect larger particles, which Cassini has already done. And also we can go through plumes at different stages of the tide, which vary all, all the way through its orbit, and we can sample individual plumes. And if there's life, then perhaps sporadic subsurface events, equivalent to algae blooms, might send interesting material into space from time to time. And also, if the research into small silver particles in Jess is correct, some of this water could have been in direct contact with hot rocks of a hydrothermal vent within months or at least a year or two. And, and this needs more spe uh, se careful study for planetary protection and flybys. For instance, long term, even the equatorial orbit is likely to be unstable. Uh, you get the rather poor idea of what we can do in situ from the mission so far. Only one of these instruments has flown so far, we as a Chris Cossack, realized Cossack. And well, it's just waking up, so maybe we'll actually, uh, and they've, they've just heard a day or two ago, they've actually got successful contact with Cossack is responding to commands. But uh, maybe we'll hear from that. Anyway, and we can now send exquisitely sensitive labs on the chips. The Astrobi Nibbler is a miniaturized version of Yuri. Uh, using subcritical liquid water extraction, we'll be able to distinguish a single molecule of any amino acid in the sample. And monoclonal antibodies can also be very subtle. That was like the LMC one earlier. Uh, can also be very sensitive. Solid 3, this one, is the Spanish one, is so sensitive that in, in a test they found a previously undiscovered habitat below the surface of the Arizona desert. And incidentally, it's not just limited to Earth organics. And the key to Cassini's success was to send a wide range of in-situ instruments. Nobody expected the plumes, but it was so well equipped it had what was needed to get started. I suggest we do the same with our search for life. And many other instruments have been developed. This can help invigorate the entire field. Many teams of astrobiologists will see their instruments fly in space for the first time since Viking. And even if they don't find anything, for instance, if this miniaturized informational polymer sequencer, set G, uh, doesn't find DNA or XNA, this may tell us it's not related to Earth life and rule out many other alternatives. And if it does find them, it sequences them. Or the microbial fuel cells, uh, if they find no redox reactions, a null result can be very significant. Uh, many of these instruments are so small, far smaller than for Viking, indeed many of them are labs in a chip, and now we can maybe even send all of these, who knows. I would suggest a high-res optical microscope as well, just because how silly it would be if there was life in our sample, purposefully moving around, and we just couldn't see it. Uh, this shows the next step, and you might think the ice mole, and you might think there's no chance of contaminating the ocean with uh, an ice mole, because after all, the geysers erupt upwards. But unfortunately, the cracks open and close with the tides on every orbit. Also, new geysers must form from time to time, and it could get crushed to work its way down, and parts of it could. Notice also the geyser's interior is a near vacuum filled with water vapor for a long way down. So how we sterilize it may depend on what we find. For instance, if the ocean consists of autopoietic cells, we need, to, we need to take great care not to introduce even dead machinery of Earth life, in case the cells take it up and learn new tricks. Or if it is closely related to us, we may need to take care of our GTAs, which can transfer genes rapidly, even overnight in seawater, to completely unrelated phyla of Arclea. 
With ideas of a super positive outcome, we need to sterilise the ice more totally, not just for the next few thousand years. I think that could be feasible. With ExoMars, they're exploring carbon dioxide snow after preliminary cleansing, and the temperatures of 31, above 31.1 degrees centigrade and high pressures, CO2 becomes super uh, critical, a state between a gas and a liquid, and it penetrates the cell's walls and dissolves organics readily. And when the pressure is reduced, the organics are blown away by hot wind, hot dry air, leaving nothing behind. We would need to sterilise the exterior in this way, and also the interior and any electronics at the end of the mission. And perhaps we could use the same method to send a completely sterile lander, and uh, it could have successfully sterilised USB drives, or perhaps you could take a long-lived ionising radiation source and use that for end-of-mission sterilisation if, uh, if it's dormant spores. Even if we solve the sterilisation issues, I suggest our commission first looks at plumes with as um, wide range of instruments we can possibly send there. Because until then, we can't do an optimal design for our ice ball and we won't know the best instruments to put on it. If we get interesting results, it will surely be easy to get funding for follow-up missions. And by then, our spacecraft may be able to get there quickly, drill more quickly, return samples sooner and have smaller and better instruments. And as for the sample return, uh, that needs a whole new talk. In short, you might be surprised at how complex the suggestions are for planetary protection for return to the Earth's surface. It would add over half a million dollars to the cost, just to return a small sample, and may still leave many safety questions unanswered, as well as requiring about a 10 years process of uh, new international and international legislature. I think the safest, simplest, and also lowest cost place to return it to would be to a teleoperated facility above geostationary orbit, which humans go nowhere near, and I have detailed reasons for that which I can explain separately. Anyway, we wouldn't know for sure how to design the return capsule until we know what we need to return, where to return it from, and how best to preserve it on the long journey back. So instead, I suggest we get the ingenious teams of astrobiologists at this stage to submit their ideas for instruments to search in situ and put all our efforts into in situ research, send the very best of these on our next mission to look at the plumes close up. And meanwhile, of course, we continue the search into ice moles and penetrators and cryobots and so forth, because we hope to send those in the imminent future after we find out results from the in-situ searches of the plumes and short out the sterilisation issues and what we need to sterilise for as well. So that, that's it. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Have we got any questions? I don't think they've even started. I think most people, as far as I know, just uh, I haven't even put it. There's a paper by Margaret Grace which goes to it in detail, and she talks about how nobody, nobody seems to be thinking about this even. I don't think there's any kind of even started on it, as far as I know. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, please. Yeah, I'm going to ask you about the Mars sample return. Yes. Thank you. 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 Any other questions? No? In that case, thank you very much, Robert. Thank you.